I got something cool to show you guys today. Check out the size of this thing. Yeah, that is the heater pad for uh, my new custom 3D printer that I've been building over there. So I'll be sharing with that, that with you here pretty soon. Just got to finish up making all the parts like this. That are ridiculous, but at a high temperature stuff. The enclosure. Woo, it's going to be good stuff. Woo, it kind of smells like China in here. I got I to gotta move that. But that's all something for the future. Let's talk about what we got going on here today in this video right here. I've been getting a lot of questions about geysers. Like, everybody's got a comment about geysers. Now, Isaiah over here says, I've managed to find a steam geyser, but I'm unsure of how to set up and produce power efficiently and or a continuous source of water. So that's two things. A uh, is how do we actually produce power from a geyser and what geysers should we even consider trying to make power from and then the second thing is if we can't produce power from it how do we cool it down cold enough to actually make use of it so let's go ahead and try to answer the first part of that question how do we produce power from these geysers so this is a topic that i've talked about a couple times before and in my last video right here full steam ahead working steam turbine experiments i actually explore different arrangements that actually work to make those steam turbines as they currently are in the game function and function pretty darn close to 100% all the time if you wanted to run it that fast. So that is the first setup that I kind of want to explore because it's something that we're familiar with. So right down here, I have an iron volcano. Now an iron volcano outputs, in this case, 18.3 kilograms a second at a ridiculously high temperature. Matter of fact, it's so high that the only metal tiles that I can use to surround this thing, or in this case where the iron comes in contact with it, is going to be tungsten. So that is, if you look at the metal refinery, you have to dig up wolframite and then refine wolframite down into tungsten because that's the only one with the properties that are hot enough or go up high enough to the melting point to where it won't just turn into uh, a liquid and then into a you know refined solid at some point. So if we look at iron, it's too cold. If we look at gold, it's definitely too cold. Steel is close. You could potentially get away with steel because it's right around the same temperature. Tungsten is way up at 3000, so that's very safe. Copper is, is also too cold. So steel and tungsten are your only options, but tungsten is definitely the better of the two options. So just to kind of take you through the steps here, well, one, you'll probably want to analyze the iron volcano, and you'll probably want to do it before you dig the entire thing up. There's actually a comment saying that you should really analyze it to where you can get your analyst to it, but they're not going to be flooded with incredibly hot iron. So <laughs> in this case, I've already analyzed this thing, and this is probably not, this is probably going to be like neutronium or something like that, so not necessarily uh, a tile. It is actually surprisingly hard to dig up your entire base, and still have a stable game. Like this has been a couple days worth of effort just to dig the thing up and then have the game be stable <laughs> for whatever reason. All right, so once you have your geyser or volcano analyzed, you're going to have some more information over here. And this is important actually, because it will let you know if you even want to mess with this geyser or not. Um, in this case, we have a rate. So this is going to be 18.3 kilograms a second. And then you have the temperature right there, which is incredibly hot. The eruption period is basically how long it's going to be active over a certain amount of time to give you some sort of frame of reference, because this is kind of a random number over here. 600 seconds is one complete cycle. So this will be, you can do the math and figure it out, but you have the active period is it'll be 111.8 cycles out of every 223 cycles. So that gives you some sort of idea of how much how much it's going to be active. So every other cycle or so. And you can see the next time that it'll it'll erupt here in 0.6 cycles. So you if you really wanted to get into this really deep, you could say, okay, so every so many cycles, I'm going to get, you know, this amount of material multiplied by that amount. And you can figure out how much actual thermal energy you're going to get out of that, you know, volcano or geyser is essentially what you can do there. And then the last bit of information right here is dormancy. So this will be dormant in the next 72.3 cycles. Uh, to give you an idea, this one over here, this is just a little hydro, um, hydrogen vent. And this is currently 
dormant. So it, you can see that right there. It'll be active in 21.3 cycles. So they are active for a while, then they go dormant, and then they come back eh, kind of like a volcano or a geyser. <laughs> Just, so that's what, it, what they're trying to simulate right there. But in this situation right here, there's a lot of thermal energy that's being created in iron. So we can, we can harvest a lot of that, and we can do it in a couple of ways. In this case right here, we're going to use a steam turbine in order to produce electrical energy. The other way would also be to take crude oil and reprocess that into natural gas and burn natural gas off, which gives you a lot of really useful byproducts, which I think some people have looked into and actually found that refining uh, crude oil into natural gas is probably going to be far more efficient than running a steam turbine. But let's go ahead and just take a look at how we can actually run a steam turbine system here. So what am I doing to make that work? Obviously, I have a metal tile down here, which takes the flood over from the iron volcano, which is currently, well, it's actually in some air, but you can see how hot that air is. It's incredibly hot, over 2,000 degrees Celsius. But right down here is where the liquid iron would be. And then I have little chunks of refined metal above that just because of that's how it actually worked. So below that, I have a couple of mechanized airlocks. Now, these mechanized airlocks are hooked up to an automation cycle right over here. And this is a thermal sensor. So this is set up at its maximum temperature of 300 degrees Celsius. What I'm trying to do is keep this steam inside of here hot enough in order to run the steam turbine. But I don't want it to overheat everything that's in this area so that I don't have to use really expensive materials. And the other half of this, if I end up destroying a little bit of steam with the mechanized airlocks, I don't want to lose all that extra thermal energy. So I really only want to keep this hot enough in order to operate the steam turbine. So 300 degrees Celsius is a safe number, and that's what I went with. You probably could get away with this a little bit lower. But why does this work? Well, the reason this works is because there's four mechanized airlocks up here, and these mechanized airlocks are just made of iron ore. So when these close, what it does is it's going to uh, remove this area of vacuum right here. And then the thermal energy, which is hotter above this, is going to transfer across those mechanized airlocks into the metal tile down here below and into all of the steam and the thermal shift plates into the, the area down here below. So this right here is a very key piece of equipment because it gives us loads and loads of control. So when the doors are closed, we're transferring thermal energy, but when they're open, we completely isolate it off. So I don't know exactly what we wanna call it. We're gonna call it a thermal control coupler, right? A TCC, I don't know. There's probably some sort of sophisticated name for it, but I've not, I haven't found it yet. So right now this steam turbine is disabled, but what I need is to have this area down here from my testing uh, to mostly be right around 20 kilograms. So that gives you an idea of just how much steam you need in this area. And it's quite a lot in order to make this thing run. And that's just what I found over my trial and error of me messing around with this for the last couple of hours. So rather than take you through all of that again, because I've already done several videos on that, th th these are my findings. And that's an important thing because there's a lot of steam down here, which takes a lot of energy in order to you know, convert enough water into steam and then take that steam from 100 degrees Celsius up to, well, in this case, 300 degrees. So the key thing I found here uh, through my experimenting is that it's pretty much only really useful for the magma and then the molten metals because the amount of thermal energy it takes in order to, to get stuff hot enough. Even though we do have many different geysers that are outputting at roughly 500 degrees Celsius, you know, such as oil, maybe, but like contaminated oxygen, carbon dioxide, or hydrogen, there's simply not going to be enough thermal energy inside of that in order to get steam hot enough and make it work. It's just not gonna be worth the effort. So to kind of show you that I've been messing around with this up here, so here's an example of a hydrogen vent where it's simply not useful for creating power via steam generation. So even though it does output at 500 degrees Celsius, it's only 139.4 grams a second for not even a complete cycle. And that's simply just not gonna be enough energy to make it happen. So we're better off trying to cool down that hydrogen so that we can feed it through a gas pump, which just needs to get down to, I believe 125 degrees Celsius. So there's a 
a, a fair delta there that we can actually make use and try to maybe refine a little bit of polluted water into steam and then maybe harvest a little bit of dirt out of that. So that might be one useful thing. And we'll start to look at that here near the end of the video. But long story short, we got to focus on the geysers that are actually using liquids and that are well above 500 degrees Celsius. So that's one example right there. Another example that I have down here is this steam vent right here. So this steam vent, here's here, here's yet another uh, struggle of just trying to harvest straight off of a steam vent. So while this does output at 500 degrees Celsius, it's only outputting at 56.4 grams a second. Now to run a steam turbine, it takes a lot of steam. You gotta get, you gotta run from one side to the other and have it maintain three kilograms difference. So in this situation right here, what I've done is I've let this build up for a long, long time. And what I'm trying to do is using a bit of an automation sensor. So this automation signal at some point or another will actually turn on these mechanized airlocks and then force a lot of that steam into kind of a pressure chamber. And then once this reaches over 20 um, kilograms, it will then open this bulkhead um, as a mechanized airlock into a restricted inlet, which actually does work, even though the input says blocked, they still haven't made a change to that. And that will allow the steam turbine to run. And then I've got these stacked up in parallel, no, sorry, in series, so that one temperature here drops to another temperature, drops to another temperature, and we'll try to get as much power out of it as possible. But the answer is this still takes so long and so much stuff to set up to where it's really not even worth it. Still, I want to see if it works. So let's go ahead and flip this real quick here. We'll try to operate these doors. <laughs> yeah, no. And we'll see if we can get a little bit of power out of this. So here we go. We've got some steam. We're going to pull it into this area and see just how much energy we can hopefully harvest here in the cycle 42. Here's the other half of this thing temperature right so <laughs> this is still only 133 degrees celsius so even though we do have enough steam in as far as its quantity it may not be enough to heat up the mass of our turbine enough to make it work because that's 800 kilograms Ugh. all right so i'm now into cycle 42 and i'm just going to go ahead and flip this it's just about to 20 kilograms which is the maximum that i can sense with this pressure sensor here so let's go ahead and flip that to below and see if i can get some electricity out of this thing come on yeah oh it wants to no oh no so see some of this water is actually going to drip down and that's going to cause a problem here so there we go now i'm getting some electricity out of this initial burst of steam and then it's struggling no more power you can do it this one's trying it's trying come on you can do it what if I mop this up? We'll get rid of some of that water. Come on now. I still have seven kilograms, but now what am I running into? It's now under pressure because this one is not hot enough to run. So as you can see, that just isn't working. Let's just try to just run two. No, even though this is like completely open up there. Oh, well, that was disappointing. So as you can see here, I was only able to get 70.4 kilojoules out of this which is like nothing <laughs> it's just terrible let me go ahead and reload that last um cycle here and we'll try a little bit different arrangement but i believe that's more or less the point that i'm trying to go for here is that even though we have a steam vent unless you have a decent amount of steam coming out of it it's probably not even going to be worth it so i'm going to deconstruct all of this and then i'm going to clear it out I'm also going to mop it up. So now this pretty this top steam turbine here should pretty much just run without any restrictions. So I'll try to pump as much steam in here as possible. We'll let this run again. Flip that to below. See, we're just trying to get up to temperature at this point. It might even be worthwhile to do something like this where uh, I try to keep the liquid from puddling up on top of it. Because as you can see, it starts to rain. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. 
So there we go. We pretty much puffed all the steam through this thing that we're going to get. And what did I get for his power? 78 kilojoules. Lame! All right, I'm gonna run it one more time, but this time I'm just going to dig it out into free space so that all I, I basically have nothing to hold any of that steam back that makes it through the steam generator. So all of this will just go like that. And then we'll run off into the environment. Whoop, don't crash on the game, please. Okay. So this is basically the best case scenario. You've got a steam turbine is just gonna throw all of that steam through it and we'll see what kind of power we get out of it. All right, so it's up to temperature. The steam's running through and we're producing 2,000 watts of power. Yeah, it's running pretty good too. And then we run under pressure again. Oh, good. come on, keep going. So pretty much every time that this inlet gets down to a rate around five or four or five kilograms, this thing tends to struggle to keep up. Like it just won't have enough pressure. However, we can see the big difference here. I was able to get about 130 kilojoules worth of power out of this thing. Come on, a little bit more. Oh yeah, it's got a little bit left in it. Yeah, good job. All right, so looking at the reports here, what did I have? 132.8. So it worked out, but I more or less threw all this steam into a giant vacuum. So that's not necessarily realistic at all. So that starts to lead the question into the second half of what Isaiah was talking about here. And that is, how do I get a continuous source of water out of this kind of setup? You know, I've got 500 degrees Celsius, or maybe I have one that's a little bit cooler at right around 100 degrees Celsius. But how do I cool the steam into water or how do I cool that water down far enough to actually make it useful for something like a farm? So that's what I have going on over here. This is hooked up to a cool steam vent so there's a good chance that when this is in your base it it will just be a puddle of water because it's surrounded by you know uh stuff that's actually going to sap away its thermal energy enough to actually condense that into water but let's say we can there's a couple different ways one we could run it through the steam turbine maybe we'll get a little power out of it or not but we can then vent that into an area like this so this isn't necessarily an ideal arrangement i'm going to do more experiments on cooling loops and temperature control and but that's just a much bigger topic that I, i'm not gonna have time to cover today in one video it'd be like forever long and nobody would ever get all the way through this but if we take a look at the automation here there is one kind of key bit of of tech that i think is going to be really useful for what we're trying to do here and that is this little mechanized airlock arrangement here so what I have here is a hydro sensor, and that runs to the three doors. And this is exactly what we were doing over here, right? So it's some sort of thermal control coupler, right? Or TCC or whatever we're going to call that. And this, it runs in such a way that when it, the condition is not met, these two doors are closed. Now, the reason those two doors are closed is because they're going to block off this and the thermal energy that we have over here from what we have over here. So this one may change in temperature if you have a gas there, but if we're only dealing with steam, this will eventually become a vacuum, which is a great way of making a vacuum, by the way, if we pump steam into an area and then cool it down enough. Think about that. All right, so here's the important bit to this manual airlock system, and that is how we're controlling the center mechanized airlock. So this is set up to run off a hydro sensor. So when the condition is not met, it will be in this arrangement right here. So closed, open, closed. However, it runs in such a way that it actually kind of is all open. So it lets all that gas through and then it closes the door and reopens it. And what that does is it destroys any sort of gas we have in the middle there, creating a thermal separation between the two zones. So let me just go ahead and show you how this works. If I click this to above, we'll see that steam is going to find its way through here. And then when I click it to below, it closes those two doors, then the center door closes and reopens. So what this is, is it's a, a hydro sensor in this case. It could be many different things, a, a switch on the floor or all kinds of things like that. But it runs through a buffer gate, which then runs into the first side of our, our XOR gate or the ZOR gate. And there's a, many different ways to pronounce such a gate and all of them are incorrect. The, uh, then it runs, it bridges off to another buffer gate and then to a knock gate to run onto the other side of the XOR gate here. So when these are not the same, it's active. 
and that's how this works. And so we use a couple of buffer gates here to, to close that door and then bring it back. And that arrangement works really, really good. And since it's always in an open uh, arrangement here, if we're not running an automation signal to these doors, then the duplicates will understand that they could path through this gate. Um, so this actually works really well for creating a thermal barrier between two zones that you need to have a duplicate have access to. Again, that was something I showed in one of my previous Steam arrangements right there, but uh, what you do is you just set up a little bit of an, an automation weight plate on the other side, and that runs this cycle right here. So it closes the doors, cycles it, and that creates that thermal separation. So if you have something super hot over here and you don't want to like corrupt your base, this is the arrangement. I think it's super useful and I'm going to use it a lot. So here's what I have going on in this arrangement over here. I have a bunch of Wii's warts set up in kind of a not so optimized cooling loop, which isn't really a cooling loop at all, but we will look more at that because it's suddenly becoming very, very useful. Mostly I have a bunch of Wii's warts in a box full of hydrogen. So this is a an area that has lots of cooling, a lot of thermal capacity for cooling and then I have mechanized airlocks once again creating a thermal control coupler between these two zones right here so we have some metal tile I like to use iron because it's something very very easy to find and make inside of the base it's not necessarily the best material but it works and like I said it's very easy to make inside of here is any is all going to be gold amalgam in order to sustain the temperature that is hooked up to a thermal sensor so I can set at what temperature this water is going to cool down to before it pumps out. So that is what you can use to feed your bristle blossom farms. So we can go from steam to cool water if we wanted to, or we could just cool it down enough to get to 100 degrees and then just use a hydro sensor here once it's above a certain amount of, uh, you know, water, it can then pump it out however you want to arrange that. And this over here, doesn't matter what it is, I use Weezworts in this condition, but we can use all sorts of liquids or we can use um, ice boxes and different arrangements. And that's that's what I want to explore in a different video. But as you can see right here, that's that's the sequence. So it just became cool enough, we pumped a little bit of that water out, it then opens up until we meet this condition down here, which is a certain amount of water. So in this case, just 20 kilograms across one, two, three, four tiles. And that is hot, but since it comes in contact with this metal tile, it's gonna cool down. And then it'll continue to cool down until it's cold enough to actually pump out. So you can see that closed all of the doors right there, and then we separated the thermal energy so that we're not getting a bunch of heat creep from this side over here. And the sense we're running a, a complete, um, system with all steam here once this steam cools down enough based on this metal tile it'll create a vacuum above this so we won't have any sort of heat creep between this mechanized airlock and you know some gas in this area so it's really important to keep this all steam if possible so there we go all of that steam now has turned into water or so to say condensed into water creating a vacuum so no more you know, no more heat creep is happening here and the water is cooling down and it looks like it's just about down to the right temperature and then we'll pump it out so this tends to run every cycle or so and from what i'm seeing is that this uh, box over here on the left continues to get colder and colder each cycle so it may not be completely balanced in this arrangement again that's something we'll have to look into and try to optimize as kind of a design challenge but as an example i think this works pretty good so let me go ahead and just take this to the next step here real quick. And we're going to clear this floor out, right? And then we're going to do this number. It's kind of a long run, but you get where I'm going with this, right? So if I take this arrangement, it's not necessarily the best because you only have like one single path right here. But if we pump this steam that's really hot down here, which could potentially be up to 500 degrees Celsius across the steam turbine will knock some of that temperature off of it, which is going to be really useful. We might get a little bit of power out of it, but the big thing is that we're going to drop that temperature. And then we can take that and we can run that up to our cooling system right here to kind of make use of higher temperature steam vents. So let's go ahead and just flip that to above and flip that to below. And, you know, if we get a little bit of power out of this, great. 
everything up above a certain degrees is like just super hot so it's kind of hard to see in the temperature overlay but we'll see how it runs here we can also control this thing intelligently through the use of smart batteries and you know uh, just really optimize this entire setup here but you can see we're getting a little bit of power out of this and then the steam that's making its way up here is a little bit hotter than what we had over in this area it's definitely hotter coming out of the steam turbine here so i think i might just go ahead and cheat a little bit and paint some vacuum around so that i can get some hotter t uh, steam to where it needs to go there we go yeah so you can see that some steam is making its way up here. It's a little bit hotter. It's trying to find its way over here. It's actually cooling the small amount of steam that's coming over here so fast that it's just continuously pretty much running. But it's pretty dope. I like this. This is such a fun little automation sequence here. All right, so in this, so in this arrangement here, I have the thermal sensor set to 22 degrees Celsius. The liquid that I'm getting out of it is at 20.9. So that's really dope. So another arrangement that you could use here if you don't want to pipe in or just use doors to a steam turbine is you can potentially run a gas pump. Now, it'll have to come up to temperature before you actually enable it. Otherwise, you're going to end up breaking your pipe because if you if you phase change inside of a, a gas, if you go from a gas to a liquid inside of a gas pipe, you're going to have some major problems. So the other thing is you'll also want to make sure that when you're making your gas pipe, you're going to make it out of abyssalite. And that's the important bit right there. It doesn't necessarily have to be insulated abyssalite, just as long as it's abyssalite, you should be okay. But then again, you don't necessarily want to pump it if it's just so close. You gotta, you gotta be careful here. Uh, the pump will have to be made of gold amalgam. So there we go. We're gonna go ahead and tie this in and it's hooked up via the automation to the same liquid pipe uh, system over there. So in this case, we are actually pumping steam directly into this area, and this is cold steam. This only works with the cold stuff, otherwise it'll melt down here because it's just too hot. So the cool steam vent is being pumped on over here to the left, and we can see that we're condensing that down into liquid. You do have to run 240 watts in order to operate this, so this is less energy efficient than just running a door op open or closed, but depending on your base layout, this might be a better arrangement here. We can see that... We're starting to build up that liquid. So one of the sort of, <laughs> no, don't do that. Um, annoying things about a gas pump is that it, it doesn't really move enough gas to be make it comparable to a liquid, right? So 500 grams a second isn't a lot of water when you, when you stop to weigh out the difference between a liquid pump and a gas pump. So a liquid pump, will move 10 kilograms a second for the same amount of energy that a gas pump moves 500 grams. So it's a much bigger difference. All right, so you can see how this is working. We have steam that's being pumped in via the gas pump or steam that's coming in that's quite a bit hotter and it's getting cooled down and we're producing nice cool liquid. Again, we don't have to have to, it to be that temperature. We can make it a little bit hotter and then it doesn't have to cool as much. So on and so forth. Let's move back to the power system here just to finish up this little video. So looking back at the steam turbine over here, there's a couple things that I have set up. Um, I have a couple of automation signals that I have put down here at the bottom, and that's in order to understand how much pressure I have inside of this arrangement here. So this thing seems to run really good when I have 20 kilograms down here at the bottom. And when it's less than that, I should really add either more liquid in order to convert that into steam, trying to keep that about as close to 100 degrees Celsius as possible. Or I could just pipe in steam from, you know, this source here or that source there using a gas pump or, you know, some doors like this. Depending on how the arrangement is set up. Mostly, you just want to have enough steam to make this work. So let's go ahead and increase this. So I'm bringing in liquid at 100 degrees Celsius or pretty close to it, like 93. And once both of these are active, I should be good to go. So you can see how this system is working here. As I'm creating more and more steam down here, I have to bring that steam up to temperature, which is 300 degrees. So you can see that this uh, thermal sensor right here is running the thermal control coupling, and that is increasing that temperature back up to 300 degrees Celsius. 
Okay, so another thing is that these doors here probably don't need to run if you have the pressure at, you know, in this case, above what it needs to be, and this thing isn't running. Otherwise, these doors here have a chance of destroying a little bit of that steam in there. In this case, I just have it set up to be continuously operating right here, and this is the automation overlay. You can see what that looks like. And this was directly from another comment that you guys left me down there in the comment section below, and then I made use of over here in the full steam ahead video. All right, so here we are in cycle 47. We'll slow down the game a little bit. And we'll enable this steam turbine to see just how much power we can get out of it. Right down here, I have 26 kilograms of steam, and that should be enough with these two door pumps right here to let this thing run continuous. Now, it doesn't have to run continuous. I just want to go ahead and point that out. If you're running the steam turbine intelligently to some smart batteries, it doesn't obviously need to produce that amount of power continuously. So you can run less door pumps right here and kind of reduce the size of your steam turbine setup. But the main idea here is that the steam is continuously recirculating and all we're adding is thermal energy via the coupling right here. And that makes this operate as efficiently as it's going to get. So you can see here it is running and it's running continuously. The, t the pressure will drop to a certain point down here, but it should continuously run. And what I'm seeing here is that since these are activating, I think I might want to add a little bit more steam to this system. These really should just stay open. Yeah, because otherwise we end up in a... Uh, situation here where this is just not going to be have enough pressure so there's not a lot of steam up here but that's just because there isn't enough total steam in the system altogether so let's go ahead and just add a little bit and you can kind of trickle this in it doesn't have to be fast it could be like 200 grams a second and it may be better off to actually bring this liquid in down here which is below the pump so that when this converts over into uh, steam it's converting in an area where it's going to be, you know, create more pressure. So maybe right down here is a good spot for it. But then again, you have to deal with the temperature, so. But hey, you know what? Let's go ahead and give it a try. So let's bring that liquid in down here. Let's see what happens. Oh, well, that seems to be working pretty darn good there. So just looking at the reports for the last cycle, you can see that I got 954 kilojoules out of that steam turbine. Uh, that's pretty good. This cycle here looks like it's going to operate even better. All I've done is left this at like 50 grams a second, really slow, and yeah, the steam turbine is just running 100% all day long. And you can see that the thermal coupler here does not really close that often. It's just only for a split second. Matter of fact, I'm seeing the temperature inside of here increase. So, you know, there's more energy coming out of this volcano than I'm using up to create power. I'm gonna go ahead and let that run for a couple cycles here at high speed just to see if yeah see there we go and it's dripping in more that increases the temperature i kind of want to see where it ends up 777 so here's yet another observation this iron down here is actually cooling down you know the actual solid bit but the stuff above it is actually maintaining a, a higher temperature so there's not a lot of uh, it's not conducting the energy well enough so i think a thermal shift plate in here might be my best bet and who knows maybe some hydrogen or something whoa i did not mean to put liquid hydrogen inside of here oh that that'll cool things off in a hurry <laughs> uh whoops undo <laughs> all right hydrogen Yes, yes, this will be much better. Boosh. Yes, okay, there we go. So now I can see that temperature. Yes, it's increasing a little bit. This iron is like very stubborn. <laughs> it, it does not want to like conduct in this arrangement here. It just really doesn't. So here's what we're gonna do. We really want a liquid down here to transfer that thermal energy. So what liquid makes a lot of sense to be in a very hot area? Well, if I could find it, crude oil is going to be exactly what we want. Boom, let's drop a little bit of that in there. Now, crude oil is going to turn into petroleum and then turn into natural gas. So then, if we hook that up to a pump, right? 
And we just drop in ooh, a liquid vent that may or may not explode once I put it in there. Ah, good, it won't melt. Um, now I'm gonna put a liquid vent in there, but this time I'm going to use an iron ore liquid vent. Again, because of the the temperature that it can go up to. Yeah, come on, show it to me. There we go, 1,500 degrees Celsius, important. We'll hook this pump up just like so, and we're gonna paint in a bunch of crude oil here. So this can come from your slicksters. You can find it anywhere you want. Uh-oh, just don't do what I did and create a monster mess. Oh no, stop. Okay, there we go. So check this out. <clears throat> if I take a thermal control sensor here and I run an automation wire over there, I could say that is crap. I can't do it. I was kind of hoping that would be, we don't have a high enough temperature on the thermal um, sensor. What I was trying to do is make this to be around 500 degrees Celsius. So maybe I could do it with a, oh, there we go. I could do it with a hydro sensor. So if that's above a kilogram, then I know that there's liquid down here and then therefore it should be turned off or below. A, yeah, just use that. So now I've got boatloads of natural gas and this natural gas is really, really useful because there's tons and tons of power inside of it. And I'm also getting the extra benefit of cooling down the iron. And then I take that temperature down a little bit further by converting it into steam, which when you have this much natural gas around may not even be worth doing. So once again, we have that same problem where the natural gas is really hot. And what we got to do is we got to cool that natural gas down. So that comes back to this sort of arrangement right here. So hopefully this gives you enough sort of understanding of at least where I want to take this little short series, which is going to be like cooling really hot stuff, such as steam or in this case, natural gas, and then producing power from it. We'll try to refine these systems and come up with better blueprints in order to, to you know, give you guys some stuff that you can just throw inside your base. But this is a, a general overview of the different knowledge that I'm going to be trying to use here using the thermal couplers, I think is a great way um, of separating the two zones and it allows us to really drop things down to right temperatures, correct temperatures. It's also useful for farms. So I think there's a lot of good stuff in this episode. So hopefully, uh, Isaiah, I answered your question. And uh, for those of the other people that were asking about all the geysers down here as well, that this is all quite useful. So hopefully you guys found this video somewhat entertaining or useful. And if you enjoyed it, let me know down there in the comment section below. Also, if you've got some ideas and arrangements, feel free to leave them down there in the comment section below. I'll have to approve the links, but you guys can go ahead and post your own little pictures and everything. But that'll be absolutely awesome. I want to say thank you guys to my Patreon supporters. There's some stuff I've been working on my end, which is trying to prepare this for more of a business perspective. So I think I'll be updating the goals there pretty soon and and maybe making a pretty big announcement here in the near future. Hopefully, fingers crossed. I don't want to go into too much detail with it right now, but if you're going to see it, you'll probably see it first on Patreon. So thank you guys for watching. If I've earned your subscription, then thank you so much for that. I'll see you again next time. Stay awesome. Peace. Brothgar.